Have you ever wondered how pi is calculated to trillions of digits? Or what formula is used? Or what makes a formula better to calculate pi? There are a few things that can make certain formulas better than others. One of the things is the computational complexity of the algorithm. In this case, it's how hard it is for a computer to calculate pi. A formula like the Leibniz formula for pi seems quite computationally simple because each term is just plus or minus 1 over some odd number. To get from one term to the next, you simply change the sign and add 2 to the denominator. However, something like the Chudnovsky algorithm seems way harder to compute with all these factorials and a fractional exponent. And there's no clear way to get from one term to the next. The computational complexity also determines the speed at which it can be calculated. I calculated the first 1000 iterations of the Leibniz formula for pi and the Chudnovsky algorithm. The Leibniz formula for pi finished in 0.02 seconds and the Chudnovsky algorithm finished in 20 seconds. This makes sense because the Trudnovsky algorithm has harder computations. Let's look at how accurate these approximations were. The Leibniz formula for pi only gave three correct digits until it got one wrong, but the Trudnovsky algorithm gave 14,182 correct digits. This brings me on to the next thing, the rate of convergence of an algorithm. In this case, it's how many correct digits of pi are gained per iteration. For example, the Trudnovsky algorithm gains around 14 correct digits per term. The last thing I want to talk about is the order of convergence. Something like the Trudnovsky algorithm has a linear convergence, order 1, because it gains approximately a constant amount of correct digits per term. If an algorithm has quadratic convergence, order 2, that means the amount of correct digits would double per iteration. There is even an algorithm for pi with nonic convergence. After each iteration, the amount of correct digits multiplies by 9. A higher order of convergence can give exponential accuracy, so it must be better, right? In practice, Pi formulas with a higher order of convergence are harder to compute and don't end up being worth it. This shows that there has to be a balance of all things, computational complexity, rate of convergence, and order of convergence. If you compare highly optimized versions of different algorithms, you would get that the Trudnovsky algorithm would give the most correct digits in the least amount of time. On the 21st of March, 2022, a record-breaking 100 trillion digits of pi were calculated using the Trudnovsky algorithm. So let's look at optimizing the Trudnovsky algorithm. The optimization technique used for the world record computations is called binary splitting. Let's look at how to apply binary splitting to the Trudnovsky algorithm. First, we can factor out this. And this can simplify Next, let's bring this down so we can focus on the fraction remaining. Let's consider the function f of n to be that, and let's substitute it into the sum. Consider we had some f of n minus 1, and we wanted to multiply it by something to get f of n. To find this something, we would need to calculate f of n over f of n minus 1, which is this. First, let's expand all the brackets. Next, dividing by something is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Now, let's combine the fractions together and split them again with their corresponding parts. First, let's work on the powers. We know that dividing powers with the same base is the same as subtracting their exponents. Now, 
Let's work on n minus 1 factorial. We know that n factorial is the product of natural numbers up to n. And if we divide by n, we get n factorial over n to be the product of natural numbers up to n minus 1, which is n minus 1 factorial. There is similar logic for 6n minus 6 factorial and 3n minus 3 factorial. So we get this which can simplify to this. Now, let's distribute the cube and simplify more. Now, let's factorize where possible. And this is the same as this. Now, let's combine all of this into one big fraction and cancel out some terms. Now, let's multiply these together and evaluate this. This is divisible by 24, so let's reduce. And this is our final result for f of n over f of n minus 1. Let's define this to be g of n. So, if we have f of n minus 1, we can find f of n by multiplying by g of n. Now, it's important to note that f of 0 is 1 from the original definition of f. Now, let's substitute n equals 1. We get that f of 1 is f of 0 times g of 1, which is just g of 1. Let's try n equals 2. We get that f of 2 is f of 1 times g of 2, which is g of 1 times g of 2. Let's try one more, n equals 3. We get that f of 3 is f of 2, times g of 3, which is g of 1 times g of 2 times g of 3. In general, we see that f of n is the product from j equals 1 up to n of g of j, which is this. This definition of f is only defined for n greater than 0, because you can't evaluate this at j equals 0. Let's go back to this. Because this new definition of f isn't defined at 0, let's compute the first term of the sum and add it on. Now that k is always greater than 0, we can use this definition of f. The product of fractions is the same as the product of the numerators over the product of the denominators. Let's define p of ab to be the product from j equals a up to b minus 1 of this. Let's also define q of a v to be the product from j equals a up to b minus 1 of this. You'll soon see why the product is only up to b minus 1. We can replace the products in the sum with p and q of 1 and k plus 1. Now, let's define s of a v to be this sum from k equals a up to b minus 1. And note that p and q's first argument is a instead of 1. Now, let's define r of a b to be q of a b times s of a b. Now, let's consider some value m between a and b. This is going to be used to recursively compute the functions. I think it's clear that p of a b equals p of a m times p of m b, and q of a b equals q of a m times q of m b, because they're defined as a product from a to b minus 1, which is the same as a product from a to m minus 1 times the product of m to b minus 1. This is why the product is only up to b minus 1. Now, let's try to find s of a b in terms of s of a m and s of m b. If we try s of a m plus s of m b, we'll see that s of m b will be missing p of a m over q of a m in every term. So, we get that s of a b equals s of a m plus p of a m over q of a m times s of m b. Now, let's use these 
for r of a there. Let's expand the brackets and simplify. And we see that q of a m times s of a m equals r of a m. And the same logic here. So we get that r of a b equals q of m b times r of a m plus p of a m times r of m b. Now let's look at the cases where b is one more than a. This is going to be the base case for our recursion because there won't be any more values between a and a plus 1. For p of a and a plus 1, it's the product from j equals a up to a of this which is just this evaluated at j equals a. There is the same logic for q of a and a plus 1 and s of a and a plus 1. For r of a and a plus 1, let's replace s of a and a plus 1 with this and simplify. Using the original definition for r of a b, we can see that s of a b equals r of a b over q of a b. Now let's go back to here. This sum is just s of 1 and infinity. Let's solve for pi. We can never compute s of 1 and infinity, so instead we compute s of 1 and n, and as n approaches infinity, our pi approximation will get better. Now, we can replace s of 1 and n with r of 1 and n over q of 1 and n, and simplify. This is the final calculation we will do to approximate pi. Now that we've gone over all the mathematics, let's look at implementing the Chudnovsky algorithm in Python. Let's start by importing the decimal module to handle decimals to any desired precision. If you don't want to do this, you can look into something called fixed point arithmetic. Let's define a function called binary split, which takes in a value for a and b. This function is going to return p, q and r of a, b in that order. This function is going to compute these with recursion. The base case for this recursion is if b equals a plus 1 then we can directly compute them with these. If it's not the base case, then we'll compute the midpoint m between a and b and compute p, q and r of a, m and m, b. Now, let's compute p, q and r of a, b from them with these. And that's all for the binary splits function. Now. Let's define a function called Chudnovsky, which takes in a value for n. This function is going to return better approximations for pi as n gets bigger. First, let's compute p, q and r of 1 and n using the binary splits function. And now, simply return an approximation for pi with this. And that's it! This is the main logic behind the binary splitting of the Chudnovsky algorithm, but there are more optimizations that can be made, such as using a faster multiplication algorithm, or doing something like this so that the final calculation is easier. Now that we've written a program that can calculate pi, what's the point of calculating pi to many digits? In truth, You'd never need to calculate parts of a circle using pi to trillions of digits. If you were to calculate the entire circumference of the universe, given its radius, you would only need 38 digits to be off by the size of the smallest atom. But the computation of pi can actually be used to test a computer's hardware and software. For example, in 1986, some hardware problems were found in one of the original Cray 2 supercomputers because a program that should have calculated pi didn't work as expected. There are many different interesting topics around pi computation, such as the history of pi computation and how to check if pi approximations are accurate. There are links in the description 
for references and further reading if you are interested. Thanks for watching.